So let's face it, I'm not that great at baseball. The only reason why I keep trying is because I feel like with enough practice, I could be amazing at it. So today, I'm gonna make an AI. Wait, 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 uh -huh. I know you don't think you're about to talk through this whole video on screen. Well, yeah I do, this is my channel. It's your channel, but you're stepping into the AI world now. It's a lot different out here. What do all these people have in common? Kerry KH with his Walmart avatar. Jabril's with his very realistic but non-talking avatar. And Code Bullet with his computer man. They all have avatars when dealing with AI. You're not Siraj, you can't rap. But I can rap. No, you can't. The rule of YouTube AI is that you need an avatar. No evolution causing so much confusion. Got Gene knows I can make Dragon Ball fusions. Anyway, so I'm just gonna mesh all of these together so I can be the ultimate avatar. One sec. Ah! Okay, you're just gonna have to create me. Alright, and now using deep learning, let me extract your voice, Ahad, real quick. Just so we can't tell the difference. My name is Ahad. My name is Ahad. <laughs> My name is Ahad, welcome to the channel. There we go. Okay, where was I? We're gonna create an AI that will find the most optimal solution to hitting the ball. Let's get started. All right, where do we start? I think I wanna begin with Canvas first. I wanna make sure I have a basic understanding of how collisions and physics work in Canvas before I start anything else. So after playing around with Canvas for a little bit, I finally got this ball in line on the screen. And now we have the line and ball interacting with each other. So the ball is colliding with the line. And that's kind of it. I just want to remember how to use Canvas a bit because that's what our physics engine will be using. Of course, I'm not going to go build my own physics engine because we want this to be as close to real life as possible when we bring this into the real world. So we're going to use a physics engine that has been worked on for months, if not years. The only thing though, is that I don't know what physics engine to use. The closest thing I've worked to a physics engine before was Phaser, but that's more of a games framework with a physics engine built in. Too much of an overkill, I felt like. I also kind of wanted to learn an actual physics engine to put in my tool belt. So I searched all across DuckDuckGo, you know, we don't use Google over here, DuckDuckGo for life, for different physics engines. What I finally decided to use was though, was Matter.js. The choice of why I chose Matter.js was pretty simple. Their sleek documentation page just took my, it just took my heart away, you know? I love their documentation page. I'm a simple man. I see nice things, I want nice things. Also, their API looked a lot more modern than the competition. So the only competitor that I've seen that was a real contender was Botch2D. And I've heard of people using this before, but I'm using Matter. After picking up their documentation page, it didn't take too long. About 200 lines later, I had a fully functional baseball clone. All right. So the next task on the plate, don't worry, I'll be here all night, was a way to determine the score and camera control so we could see what's going on when the ball is hit off screen. So as you seen in the last video, it was hitting the ball, but we couldn't actually tell what's happening after it. We're gonna fix that now. In baseball, the main goal is to hit the ball as far as possible. Well, at least in the home run derby it is. So figuring out what to keep track of for the score was trivial. The more distance left the ball is hit, the better the score. That's what our reward will be when we start building our neural network. The negative reward, of course, is the opposite. The further right the ball goes, the bigger the punishment. Now we know in a normal graph, the X and Y coordinates goes right for X normally for positive and then left for negative. So we're just gonna have to reverse it. We're just gonna multiply the coordinates with a negative one. So next up, for visual purposes, we wanna be able to see what's going on after the ball is hit. But we also wanna keep a reference for how far the ball is in the world. Because if we're just following the ball with a camera, what does that really mean? What is that saying to us? We need to have that reference point. So our reference point will be the bat. So we're gonna make sure the bat is always in the furthest part of the camera and then the ball is on the opposite side. That kind of ended my first day. But for the second day, I wanted to start to get this neural network started. Anytime I'm trying to learn something new or start a new project, I make sure I go through a brainstorming stage before I start anything. And that kind of guides us along the way. So let's get this brainstorming process started so we'll figure out what we need for our AI. Number one on the plate, what we'll need are inputs. Without inputs, the AI doesn't know anything. It doesn't know what to do. If it starts getting rewards for certain things, it's not gonna understand what to relate that to. So just like for us, say we're hungry. That hunger, pain is an input. 
when we finally eat, we feel rewarded and we feel that hunger go away. So that's kind of our input and then our output is to eat. So that's what we need to give our AI. We need to give it some knowledge of the world. So what will be our inputs? There's a few different paths that we can go down, but for sure, I know I want the X and Y value of the ball to be the main two inputs. We could also add the speed as an input or even the velocity if we want to throw some curveballs at it, you know? For now though, let's only focus on X and Y. I'm confident that the algorithm will learn that when the ball's X and Y value is sitting right in front of it, the ball will hit it, at least eventually. So I'm not, I'm not too concerned about the speed and velocity for now, at least until we start throwing curveballs at it. But a part of me is not very convinced that this is all the game is gonna need. I think we're still missing one thing that'll be very crucial as an input. What will the AI use to keep track of when it attempted to hit the ball last time? The time from when the ball was thrown, I believe that's essential. See, this is why we brainstorm. Without that, the AI may be shooting in the dark and never actually learn to win the hit. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe X and Y would be sufficient since the AI would try various different X and Y points to hit the ball. See, this is why we brainstorm our brainstorm. <laughs> now, before we dig all the way into neat, there's still a bunch of things that come before neat. We'll go over super simplification of machine learning in general. So at the top layer, we have supervised learning, also known as classification which we went over when we made our color sorter. Supervised learning though, isn't for the weak as it takes a lot of data collection. Thankfully though, that's the toughest part. You'll normally use supervised learning when you know the answers to the question that you want your AI to solve. Some examples of supervised learning are sorting light and dark colors, image object detection like convolutional neural networks, differentiating between a cat and a dog, etc. Next up is unsupervised learning, also known as clustering. You'll use this when you're really lazy and you want your AI to find a pattern between your sets of data. What it will do is cluster your data into similar chunks. It's easier to get started with unsupervised learning because you just throw all of the data at it, but it takes much longer than say supervised learning because a train has to come up with its own similarities on its own instead of you just telling it what it needs to look for. You'll normally use unsupervised learning when you don't have the resources to collect or label the data, or if you just want to leave it to the AI to find similarities. An example of unsupervised learning is your phone grouping similar faces and making a person group out of it. When you're taking pictures of a person multiple times, you'll see your phone automatically group that person. It doesn't know who they are, but it knows that they're the same person. And the last one we're going over is reinforcement learning. Now this is what we've came for. This is why we're here. Reinforcement learning is actually the one that got me interested in machine learning in the beginning. I'm sure by now you've all seen the Mario video by Seth Bling. When you first watch it, if that didn't get you off your seat, I don't know what will. Reinforcement learning is close to unsupervised learning where you won't feed it any data at first. But instead of clustering similarities, it'll find the best solution to your problem through trial and error. You'll normally use reinforcement learning when you may not know the optimal solution like you do with supervised learning, but you can give the AI the steps it needs to reach its goal. An example of reinforcement learning is teaching a mouse to learn how to navigate a maze by feeding it cheese. Or even OpenAI, the AI that beat hundreds of Dota 2 players a few months ago. You know, the one that was all in the news. That used reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is what we'll be using. There are a few different categories under reinforcement learning. One of those categories is a genetic algorithm. A genetic algorithm's whole premise is survival of the fittest. If you aren't better than the rest, you get chopped. And it will continue this cycle until you tell it to stop. Now, if an organism kept doing the same thing, obviously it's never gonna get better. This is where exploration comes in. Genetic algorithms encourage exploration and trying new things. Just a word of warning though, little genomes. If it doesn't work out, you're getting chopped. You won't make it to the next stage. But if you do make it, little genomes, you'll be able to reproduce and have your own family. Now, of course, like a regular human, your child is not gonna look exactly like you. You also want your child to be stronger and better than you. So your better half will grow some of their chromosomes as well. That's what you call a crossover. So the child gets a little bit of the first parent and a little bit of the second parent. That's not all though. The child could also be mutated a little bit. Every chromosome won't just be a copy of the father and mother. Some of their chromosomes can be mutated a little bit to make them their own organism and not just a complete copy of the father and mother. And this is what allows them to continue on exploring for a better life, better than their parents. They want to be better. They don't want to just be the same thing. Because if they're the same thing, you're going to get the same results. What I just explained here is neuroevolution. And within neuroevolution, there's an algorithm that specifically deals with finding the fittest organism. That algorithm is called NEAT. Neural Evolution of Augmented Topologies. Say that three times fast. Now, I know that was a lot to take in. I hope you understood the gist of it, though. But don't worry if you don't yet, because we still got half of the video to talk about NEAT. 
you'll learn as time goes on. This video isn't going to be completely in depth of everything you're going to need for me. One of the things I are probably going to skip over is normalization. Normalization will just convert your inputs to values between 0 and 1. This is to make your algorithm converge faster. It means it will learn a lot faster than having values between negative 1000 to 5000. Okay, we explained NEAT, we explained genetic algorithms, we explained the basic categories of machine learning. Now let's move back to the code. So we successfully have a basic version of NEAT running now. As mentioned earlier, we're going to be using the library NEATTAPTIC.js. We'll go over some of the properties that NEATTAPTIC will take in. These are the same properties you're most likely going to be sending over to any NEAT library, or if you make it from scratch, you're still going to have to know these properties. The first property you see here is input. Now the inputs of course is X and Y. We only have two inputs, so we're gonna put the number two. The second parameter is our outputs. What do we want our game to do? We only have one thing that we wanted to do, right? We just wanted to hit the ball, that's it. So we have one output. That third parameter is our fitness function, but we'll be using the default fitness function, so we can set that null. And then our fourth parameter is our configurations. Inside our configurations, we have what you see here is pop size. Now, pop size just stands for the population size. It's how many simultaneous games you want running at once. The bigger the population, the faster our network will come closer to reaching its goal, also known as convergence. The catch, though, is that it will require a lot more computing power. Just imagine you playing 50 games of Fortnite on one computer. It's not going to run well, right? But when you're playing one game of Fortnite, it's not going to be an issue. Since I'm running this off my MacBook, I tried different population sizes. I eventually landed on 10, which is kind of the sweet spot. I couldn't go much higher than 10 on my laptop because matter.js takes up a lot of computing power. Our second parameter is mutation rate. Mutation rate is the percentage of the chromosomes that we want to mutate. Remember we said we get some of the father's chromosomes and we get some of the mother's chromosomes. And then a few of them change. This mutation rate is the few that change. According to Professor Stanley, the creator of NEAT, he says that the networks with smaller amounts of inputs normally respond better to higher mutation rates. So since we only have two inputs, we're leaning on a higher mutation rate, even though we're only going 0.5 cutting in the middle. According to him, we can even go higher than that and it'll be better for the network. But we're gonna sit with 0.5. Next up is mutation amount. This number will determine how many times the mutation method will run on this network. And last but not least, we have elitism. Elitism is just a judge of the algorithm for that generation. Its goal is to just choose the best organism so it can use that to build the next generation. Those are all the parameters we're going to be passing into the Neat Taptic library. Now we have a little issue. As you can see here, there's code in place to stop each player in a generation so they don't run forever. The players have two cases for the game to be over. Either the ball isn't moving anymore or it goes too far past the bat. Unfortunately, this code isn't working the way I intended. Instead, it seems like if one dies, they all die. Even though we have code in place to keep track of all the games and wait until every player is finished, it doesn't care. It has no care in the world about any other game except the one that dies. I was actually searching for the fix for this issue for quite a long time. So I'm pushing this back for a little bit. And for now, we're going to pretty things up. So we have our basic version of our app running. Now, just like with Canvas for matter.js, we're going to use fills and strokes to fill out the colors. One issue that I ran into was that I was changing these fill and stroke colors, but nothing would change. There's a little kink with matter.js where if you don't turn wireframe off, nothing else changes. So if you're using this, make sure you turn it off wireframe. And then we're just gonna add a background to this and voila. If you notice, my MacBook is slowing down a lot because I'm trying to screen record and run the game at the same time. And it just can't handle it as I mentioned earlier. So with that being said, I'm going to bring this over to my desktop and let that run over there where it doesn't have any interference with the code or the screen recording that I'm doing over here. I'm going to let y'all watch the game run and see if you can figure out how to improve on the code a little bit. All right. All right. Looks decent. Looks decent. Now, we've been running this game for almost 400 generations now. We don't necessarily want to get rid of all that good juicy data. Thankfully though, I thought ahead and I built an easy way to save your network using the convenience method that NeatTaptic.js gives us. This method is called export. So if we just click S on the keyboard, it'll save your network at that time. So you may be asking, what does an exported network actually look like? It looks like a big matrix filled with different weights between your inputs and your hidden layers. Or if you don't have hidden layers, your inputs and your outputs. 
those weights is what determine the output that's all the export it really is so you watched the video i'm sure you figured out some of the things we clean up so let's move on to some of these bugs we spotted the biggest elephant in the room is that if one ball dies they all do this means that literally every game has to be moving at the same time for it to register the best score but remember since the genetic algorithm promotes exploration that would really ever happen the second big bug is that the ball slows down too much as time moves on meaning that a network is going to eventually optimize to slower moving balls. The third less important, I think, issue is to give speed or velocity to the network. I feel like velocity is pretty important, and it'll make that other issue with the ball slowing down probably non-existent, even though we need to fix that one as well. And there's this one very, very intermittent issue where sometimes the ball slips through the bat, and it kills me when it happens. Why this happens is because of this thing called tunneling. A fix that other physics engines use to fix tunneling is called continuous collision detection. But Matter.js still doesn't have this in place, sadly. Luckily, there's two hacky fixes that can be done to fix tunneling. One is having more times the physics engine is going to check for each position. How a collision works is that each iteration, it's going to check to see if this is touching something else or not. And that's how a collision happens. So if we add more times it's checking, we'll have less of an issue where it's slipping through because it's checking to see if it's hitting it or not. But of course, that's gonna take a hit on performance. Number two is that we can add a bigger area to the bat or the ball. But then, when we bring this to real life, my idea is that the bat is gonna be pretty skinny and the ball will be proportionate to the bat. And if we make any change in the game, we're gonna have to make sure it matches in real life. So, I guess we're gonna be using a bigger bat. I don't know. Now to tackle some of these bugs, number one, we're gonna add more position iterations, velocity iterations, and constraint iterations. We'll add a bit more width to the bat, Because we're updating all these iterations, we need to lower the population size a bit just so my CPU isn't just completely getting burnt out. And the last thing we fixed is the issue where the one ball dies thing. That issue was killing me. I can't really tell you exactly what was going on, but I can tell you how I fixed it. So basically there was some memory leak going on where all the events that we're listening to for each iteration was getting piled on top of each other. Every event had a reference to the same method. So when that method was called, all of the other games were called as well. So all we had to do was get rid of all of the events anytime the world was cleared, instead of clearing the engine. I believe this event issue could fix that speed issue we had as well, but we'll see. I'm still gonna leave velocity out the inputs. I still don't think that's a big concern. All right, with all these fixes in, let's test this bad boy out. doesn't want to play anymore let's figure out what's going on with that bug oh okay the world that hit was just being called inside world instead so we don't need two listeners for the events anymore we was listening to it inside game as well as inside world let's just put everything inside world so world that hit is going to be called in every iteration now things are looking good i like this we're going to let this run for a little while and see if it can get higher than its last high score, which was 15,900. My theory is that it's definitely going to get higher because we added more speed and added a heavier bat, so I'm positive it's going to get higher than the last score. I forgot to change the population size back to 10. We're running this on the desktop now, so we could definitely change this size back to 10. Because right now, with only 4, it's taking too long. So it looks like we're hitting our maximum score around 16,600. I'm super satisfied with that. I would have never thought that I could even get that high of a score because when I was trying, I was only getting around 6,000, 7,000. Granted though, I didn't have the speed and the width of the bat that the AI has, so. <laughs> and now, what we've all been waiting for. It's time to extract the values out and figure out what the best X and Y values are. I could have used some nice graphs to figure out what the best X, Y values are from the weights, but I'm too lazy to figure that out right now. So instead, I'm gonna pause the app right before the bat is about to hit the ball. And we're gonna take an average of every network of when it tries to hit the ball. So after taking the average, we have X value being 1.075 and Y value being 0.67. Of course, this is relative to the bat. One thing that you may have caught as well is that the bat is never full in contact with the ball. You can see it's right at the tip of the bat. That means if we raise the ball's Y value just a tad bit, 
we will probably see much better results. Right now, what I notice is that the bat is always hitting the ball to the southwest corner. I'm wondering though, is northwest better? Maybe center is better? I don't know, we'll find out. The network will have a chance to actually try different angles now. With this update, let's check it again. Oh my god, it's already right under 19,000. That was so quick. <laughs> that was so quick. Yes, this is definitely a big issue not having full contact with the ball. And then another generation, 27,000, almost a two times increase. This is ridiculous. All right. I'm convinced that it can't even get higher than 27,000 because now it's just trained on that bottom, that southwest corner. So let's restart the whole network and let it train again from scratch. So as you can see right now, it's hitting the ball to a northwest angle. I want to see if it sticks with that angle and finds out that that's the optimal solution. In my mind though, that southwest angle probably is the best because that's when the bat has the most rotational energy. I feel like with that northwest portion, the air friction is going to slow down the bat a little too much. But we'll let the AI figure it out. We'll see what the best angle of hitting the ball is. We'll come back in a few hours and see what it comes up with. So according to the network, I was right. That southwest corner is probably the best way to hit it because that's the most rotational energy. And that's what you see the network continuously doing. Anyway, that was super fun. That was a super fun project, but we're not done yet. We're bringing this to the real world. You know, electrical engineering, this is what we do. We bring it to the real world and we're gonna make an environment similar to this one and see how it performs. And that ends part one. So that was just part one of Meatball. We're gonna have a part two where we bring this out into the real world and simulate an environment similar to the game. So we're gonna create a bat and a ball and we're gonna give that world the neural network. And hopefully, if everything works out correctly, that neural network will swing that bat as soon as the ball is around that X and Y position we found during training. So just hang on to your seats for part two. In other news, we had a giveaway last week. We'll be announcing the winner somewhere around here. Hopefully if you're watching this, your DMs are open and we can give you your Raspberry Pi 4 or 3B Plus. We won't be having a giveaway this week since we're having a part two, but we'll be having a giveaway when we make part two of this neat ball video. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. It means a lot. Please do this. Just like, comment, and subscribe. It's not that hard. It helps the channel. It helps me out a lot. Just do it. <laughs> also, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm over there talking to myself most of the time, so I can use some company. Come over to the Twitter. Anyway, until next time, continue to embrace the spark. And they don't know what the chrome, what the chrome so do you?